I'm so delighted to welcome you to this programme. Firstly, if you want to access BSL, please pin our signer, Tracy Tyler. We'll be working with two um, BSL um, interpreters today and they'll alternate. So pin Tracy Tyler now and Jill Blackadder shortly. Um, we'll pause to give time for you to find the other signer as they alternate. We also have live captioning and if you'd like to find a stream text link in the chat text. We've chosen to meet together in Zoom rather than have a webinar so that we're all in the room together. So please switch on your camera if you're happy to do so and feel connected to this community. We'd like to think of it as a meeting, not a meeting. So we're meeting um, together, we're connected. I'm Richard Watts, I instigated this programme and I'm so delighted to see you here. Welcome. So um, Culture Reset has been built in weeks, responding to these extraordinary times. And we've made the programme in a form that you shape to make it work for you and answer your unique pressing questions. I run People Make It Work and we exist to help cultural organisations and leaders change and develop. And we're made up of a community of freelancers and we sit in service to you all and the brilliant work you do. We're actively committed to an inclusive programme and you'll find BSL, live transcription and other access support where you've told us it will help you to fully participate. We're committed to quote Jamie Bedard, hello Jamie, to hearing what you need to do your best work. If there are things missing, that would help you get the most from this programme, let me know. The Kalus Gulbenkian Foundation has helped fund this programme to a very significant degree, making all places free of fees. They supported us within weeks of our approach and this programme is part of their commitment to helping arts and culture be more connected and relevant to audiences and communities. They've enabled us to bring together the most extraordinary team to create, facilitate, provoke, inspire, and participate in this programme. Thank you to every one of you who has made a decision to be here. In a moment, I'm gonna pass over to our programme directors, Claire Doherty and David Micklem, but just a couple of points of housekeeping before I do about today's Zoom. First of all, when you're listening to our speakers later, do think about what questions you'd like to ask them. Then would you write the word question in caps in the chat, followed by your question, and be prepared to unmute if we call on you to ask it directly. Secondly, um, in the next couple of minutes, if you can, grab an A4 piece of paper and, a thi and the thickest pen possible, all will become clear. So connecting back to our work here together, I can't think of a more important time for a reset within arts and culture to fuel and enable a wider reset within our society. So let's get started. David. Hello everyone, I'm David Micklem. And hello, I'm Claire Doherty. Good afternoon, it's fantastic to see you all here. Uh, really wonderful to see you all on a Monday afternoon. Uh, we've spent the last eight weeks devising Culture Reset, which is an urgent response to the challenges and the opportunities triggered by the current public health crisis and the related economic impacts. Now, we recognise that these crises are having a devastating effect on lives and livelihoods, and that they've shone a harsh light on existing inequalities right across our country. We acknowledge that these are incredibly tough times and toughest for those already having to deal with an unfair society. At a nationwide level, we hope that your participation in this programme, the work you do, the discoveries that you make, will help address some of these challenges. We also recognise that these are extremely challenging and fast-moving times for artists and arts and culture professionals, and that many of us will be facing pressures beyond the scope of this programme. And we know that coming together now, even just at the start of this programme, will give us strength as we face the months ahead. Since COVID hit, the repeated refrain from artists and arts and cultural professionals across the UK has been that our sector needs to change. 
from the hundreds of applications we've read, we know that many of you are working in contexts where cultural institutions and programming are not representative of people's lives or their own cultural interests. We've heard loud and clear from you that you're already embracing change and the, uh, already embracing the potential for change, that you want your practices and organisations to become more relevant and to adopt a spectrum of approaches to changing where culture happens, who produces it and questioning who it's for. We know that you're here because you want to join with others to make transformational change across our society. And that this moment provides a unique opportunity for an urgent and radical shift. So we also know from reading all your applications that you were already hitting challenges. The resource, the knowledge, the support to make change happen even before COVID hit. So this program offers the structure, the focus, the stimulus and the network environment to dig into some of the questions that you already had. And to share learning, to push forward what you've been meaning to test out and to form a plan of action. Crucially though, as a creative task, hello, not just an operational one. Over the coming eight weeks, we will talk, listen and watch together, but we're also aware you need to convert ideas into action. And we've conceived a program that gives you the opportunity to gather virtually, of course, like this and in smaller groups, but also to dig into this work away from screens, getting our creative minds and our creative bodies working, that compels you to talk to people that hold other perspectives and that moves us out of our bubbles and into the world. So there were over a thousand people who applied for places on this programme and we're keen to share resources and thinking and ideas with everyone as we go along. Amplifying what we do together here beyond the confines of this assembly will be really vital and the website which launched this morning will be a growing resource, publicly available resource. Claire and I wanted to briefly reflect on our personal approaches as programme directors, recognising that our backgrounds, interests and preoccupations are both similar and different. Along with our group facilitators, this will give you a sense of our approach to thinking broadly about what kind of shape the programme might take. I'm a writer and theatre producer. At Battersea Arts Centre where I worked, I learned the importance of working in partnership with communities as audiences, participants, and as artists and creatives in their own right. As co-founder of 64 Million Artists, I witnessed huge shifts in the way in which culture is conceived, what it is, who gets to make it, where it happens, and how. The notion of cultural democracy has taken root in many communities and arts and cultural institutions. The idea that we are all culture, and we should all have a stake in creating and experiencing it. I hope that through this programme we can support a shift that many of us have been reflecting on, away from a purely top-down approach to making and presenting arts and culture, to one that also reflects the strengths and power of the grassroots, the everyday, the bottom-up. Many of us have been witness to a quiet revolution and I hope that this programme will help amplify that. Not a revolution that destroys everything we've all taken so long to build, but one that supports and encourages far greater engagement from right across the country, from all walks of life. A meeting point between the top down and the grassroots, a place of cultural, relevant, a place of cultural relevance and a better future for everyone. So a bit about me, um, I'm an artistic producer, a director. I was founder director of the producing company Situations and director of Arnolfini in Bristol. And working across many different contexts, um, out, often outside of buildings and venues, has afforded me the opportunity to see how work across all art forms might connect deeply with people, outside of the institutional frame, that is. Essentially, producing for me has always been an alchemical act of balancing artistic vision with connection with place and people. I'm a really passionate advocate for tra the transformative capacity of the arts, but I really understand the personal, political and economic challenges of doing so, particularly having worked more recently with organisations to reimagine their artistic visions to become more relevant and impactful. 
So my responsibility here has been to think across all art forms to imagine how we might create a structure that allows you to find your own version of relevance, not to create an orthodoxy of practice where there is only one type of civic role or a tone or a language that starts to define this type of work. We've commissioned content, uh, curated resources and designed the structure of the group intensives but as programme directors, we'll also be producing some public conversations, such as the new podcast called Postcards to the Future, which launched this morning, and some Instagram Lives, more informal conversations between us. And we'll be popping into workshop discussions to listen in to how things are going. Thank you, Claire and David. So to remind you, the programme runs over eight weeks, um, and this is the start. While you can access resources and dialogue throughout, there are two intensive cohorts lasting four weeks. One starting what, this week, the other later in August. And each of those intensives has four workshops. These groups are facilitated by our brilliant group of facilitators. Please, would you wave as you are mentioned? So we've got the wonderful Annette Corbett, Vicky Igbokwe, Gregory Nash, Srila Ghosh, Judith Knight, Michelle Taylor, Tan Sinden, Hardish Verk, Radine Carter, Semenua Sesha, Sandeep Mahal. And I also want to get away from our producer, Zara Rush. David. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So here we all are, all 209 of us on Zoom everyone's favourite online meeting platform. Uh, we haven't been paid to say that. It's a great shame that we can't all meet in person. Uh, we know that gathering like this has its limitations and it's not perhaps as dynamic as it might be if we were all meeting in the real world. Um, we've worked hard to make this programme as engaging and accessible as we can and inevitably we will have fall, fallen short in some areas and we hope that you'll let us know when we can improve things as we go along. And as Claire says, through the programme, we want to encourage dialogue, debate, thinking and doing away from our screens wherever possible. So we're using this as a kind of principal way of connecting, but we want to get away from our screens and do thinking elsewhere uh, through the programme. Um, and just this is coming to the piece of paper that Richard mentioned at the beginning before our speakers uh, in just a moment who Claire is going to introduce. We wanted to just try something out just as an experiment. Uh, a quick in intervention to establish our collective reach and our ambition for this programme. So your instruction is, I'd like you to take your piece of paper, hopefully an A4 piece of paper or a large piece of paper and your thickest pen that you have, and in the largest letters on one side of the piece of A4 paper, I'd like you to write down the name of the place where you are. That's the name of the town or the city or the region or the village in big letters on one side of the piece of paper. And I'm going to give you a moment to do that. And once you've done that, I'd like you to turn the piece of paper over. And on the reverse side of it, I'd like you to think of and write down a single word which expresses, expresses your ambition for the programme. What you would like to get out of the next eight weeks. So it's a bit of a tough call. Just one word that really reflects what it is you would like to get out of the next eight weeks. Okay, so I'm not giving you very long to do that. Uh, what I'd like you to do is, as I am doing now, is hold up your piece of paper with the place where you live underneath your chin so we can see your face and we can see um, where you're from. And I haven't actually written down mine either. Here we are. I'm in Brixton. Can we see everybody where they are? Fantastic. Bradford, Kentish Town, Manchester, Bristol, Dulwich, all over the country and around the world. Eastbourne too. Fantastic. And just to finish up, I'm going to ask you to flip over your piece of paper under your noses, under your chins, the word that expresses what you would like to get from this programme. Fantastic. We'll find a way of capturing all this on the video later on. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass over to Claire. Thank you. I love that. My favourite uh, place just then was Yatton, 
shout out to Lessie from who's in Yatton. Um, but yeah, I love that embodied people in all sorts of places all over the country. Right, so in the spirit of digging in, we are going to move now to our fantastic guest speakers um, to start getting our brains whirring and thinking with three provocations that we've asked for today. Um, our speakers are John McGrath, who is in Manchester, Jasmine Wahif, who is in New York, and Marcus Fastino with Paul Heritage Translating, who is in Rio. So first off to John McGrath, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome John. He is the Artistic Director and Chief Executive of Manchester International Festival, the world's first festival of original new work and special events. He has a reputation for large scale site specific work, digital innovation and extraordinary community involvement. He was, of course, Artistic Director of Contact in Manchester from 1999 to 2008, where he pioneered a vision for a theatre made by, with and for young people. And of course, many of you will know in 2009, he became the founding director, Artistic Director of National Theatre Wales, where he pioneered dozens of commissions celebrating the world in Wales and Welsh artists in the world. So I'm delighted to welcome John McGrath from Manchester International Festival. Over to you, John. Thank you, Claire. What an amazing group of people on my screen. It's a real joy to, to see the faces. So, um, it's an honour verging on an embarrassment to be asked to contribute to the thinking of a gathering of people as extraordinary in their practice and rich in their experience as this group of 209 souls here today. All the more so to be alongside such profound and influential practitioners as Jasmine Wahi and Marcus Faustini. With such a gathering of minds and of purpose, there are surely no limits on what can be done to reset our cultural landscape. We've all been very conscious in the past weeks and months of the structural inequalities and systemic injustices that are embedded in the practices and organisations through which culture in the UK is publicly delivered. It is our job, each of us, in our different ways and from our differing lived experiences, to reimagine and patiently reinvent those structures. There is so much knowledge in this virtual room to bring to that effort. But what is the ultimate goal on the horizon? A more justly distributed and structured arts ecology or a differing role for art in society? I know that we're about to hear two brilliant practitioners outlining how artistic practice can be key to social transformation. Let me bring a few additional voices into the room. In the past few days, I've spoken to Samson, an artist in Hong Kong, who told me how important it is for arts organisations in the UK to keep working in every way they can with artists, festivals and venues in Hong Kong, as the people there try to maintain the structures of civic society. I met with JK, a director in the Philippines, whose company is creating work which rehearses the international trial for extrajudicial killings that they hope their current president will soon face. And I talked with Gabriela, a performance maker in Brazil, who is working with the women of the Amazon to make the voices of the great Amazonian rivers heard in the world. As director of an international festival here in the UK, what is my role for and with these artists? I've also met with Dewinda, a brilliant up and coming artist in the Midlands, who spent much of the pandemic as a full-time carer for her mother and is feeling intimidated by how much others seem to have achieved on social media. I talked with Yandas, a young dancer and theatre maker based in Manchester, who feels two years after graduating that all the structures and pathways for her to grow as an artist have disappeared. And I heard from Christian, a cross-media artist who's questioning the platforms and possibilities for his work as a young gay black artist in the wake of George Floyd's murder. What is my role, my usefulness, for these younger spirits closer to home? It can no longer just be about finding the best and showcasing their work. It can't only involve structures to support development. It mustn't simply be about creating networks and facilitating conversations. It has to be more than inviting the public to witness, though each of these things 
has value. To fulfill my role, our role, for these artists and for the societies they represent, the communities from which they speak, I have to ask a bigger question. What is the change that this work, this artist, this practice demands? And how do I help make that change happen? All art is about change. Not all change is noisy or turbulent, though some certainly is. Change can involve a new sense of peace, a subtlety of perception, the joy of revelation, the formation of community. But at the moment, much of cultural structure neutralizes change. By placing all art on the same walls, in the same time slots, in the same darkened rooms, we equate and yes, commodify. We ask, did I like that? Was it good? How did it compare? When we need to be asking, how am I changed by this encounter? How are the structures I am part of challenged by this experience? What will we now do differently? Art is never just a job. It's not something we can do, put to one side and leave in the workplace. If we're not profoundly shaken by every work we present or produce, we shouldn't be doing this. If we run or work for an arts organization, big or small, perhaps we need to ask ourselves every Monday morning, how deeply are we changed by what we presented last week? And how will we now behave differently, act differently in our communities? The artists I've mentioned are both local and international, and the change we enact can and must be in both these spheres. The forces that determine local experience are, after all, set by international practices and codes. But the very term international is misleading. The exchange of ideas and experiences may be across borders, but it's not between abstract national entities. It's between locations, an exchange of localisms. An exchange of localisms enacting change. This is the opportunity we have, partly discovered in the quiet conversations and global movements of these pandemic times. I'd like to finish with a few lines from a poem about lockdown, written by my friend, the great African-American poet, Patricia Spears Jones. Self-isolation. Quarantine permits the asking of basic questions. What will together feel like? Who will teach touch? What are we to make of our bodies vulnerable to sharing that which is not seen, not heard, not felt, until it is? John, thank you so much. Um, I, think, uh, <laughs> I think that you just summarised so beautifully so many of the things I've been discussing with people on these sort of meetings in five minutes where we've taken hours to do so, it's so appreciated. I think for me, the two things there that you said that really resonated with me is a concentration on how we are changed, not a concentration on does it make us better or feel good, to recognise that being changed might be being unsettled from our current state of mind or perspective. I love that, I love that. And uh, secondly, this exchange of localisms, that's a brilliant phrase in terms of thinking about internationalism and just seeing all of these um, places scroll in the chat next to it, this sense of connection between located identities not being delimited by them. So thank you so much. As I know there's so much richness in there that people are, are I'm sure, taking that on board and formulating questions for you. I'm going to go on to Jasmine and then come back to questions for you at the end, if that's OK. I think we're all just um, taking that on board and thinking about our, our questions as a result. So Jasmine Wahi, um, I'm delighted to welcome from New York, is a curator, activist, founder and co-director of Project for Empty Space. That's a not-for-profit organisation that creates multidisciplinary art exhibitions and programming that encourage social dialogue, education and systemic change through the support of both artists and communities. Now, since February, Jasmine has served as a social justice curator 
at the Bronx Museum. Jasmine, over to you. Thank you so much and thank you for having me. Um, I'm not sure what I have to say can really follow up adequately what was just said, but um, I'll give it a try. Um, so I'd like to start very briefly with a very short moment of silence, um, even though I know most of us are muted just in the spirit of collaborative effort. Um, so just a moment. And I like to start with a moment of silence, one, because I grew up in the Quaker tradition um, in Washington, D.C., but also because I found it very helpful to just recenter myself, um, and I found it a useful tool for other people to also recenter and reflect. So before I start, I want to take a very quick survey while scrolling through these pages. Um, how many people are familiar, just by a show of hands, with the term intersectionality? Okay, so fair, fair number of people, fantastic. And I always start with this because I want what I say to be legible to everyone. Um, but very, very briefly for those of you who are not familiar with this term, um, it's a term coined in 1989 by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a uh, lawyer, advocate, and legal scholar. And the term basically is the idea of multi-layeredness, multi-positionality, and the idea of vertical hierarchies of identities. So again, by a very quick show of hands, how many people identify as female? Okay. How many people identify as white or Caucasian? How many people identify as black? How many people identify as some form of Asian? How many people identify as queer? How many people raise their hand more than once? Okay, so a fair number of people. The point of, of this exercise is essentially to show that most people, and if I kept the list going on, would raise their hands at least twice. Once for whatever they identified as, I'm sorry, at least three times. Um, and at some point to say that they are more than just one thing. So point being, we're all more than just one thing. And sometimes these identities that we have work in collusion relative to the community that we are in to work against us as a form of oppression. And so that's where I like to start how I think about everything. And I apologize for my tiny dog barking. Um, so as a social justice curator, it is essential for me to always think in the reality of vertical hierarchies, whereas as a woman of color, I am in some ways disadvantaged in a professional setting, for example, than my white male counterparts. It's simply just a reality. I get paid less, or I have gotten paid less um, than some of my counterparts. I am often far more educated um, and underpaid than some of my white male or white female counterparts. Um, it's a reality of the world we live in. And so how do we change that? And for me, one of the tenets of how to change structural inequity is by changing our frames of reference. One of those being to stop thinking in terms of centricity and centering one group of people instead thinking in a multi-centric format. Multi-centric format means we can elevate and are capable of thinking of ways to highlight, elevate, and advocate for more than one group at a time. Because again, when you think intersectional intersectionally, you are thinking about multiple layers and multiple ideas at one time. 
we're all capable of thinking this way. So the second part of that is not only thinking multicentrically. Oh, I'm talking forever. I'm so sorry. Multicentrically, I'll wrap up quickly, but also thinking about visibility within this idea of multicentricity, because the primary tenet of social justice and change for me is being seen because we cannot know and we cannot make a change without knowing what we are making a change for. So unless you see me in all of my multidimensionality, in all of my oppressions, but also all of my strengths and advantages, you won't be able to see what the issues are that I face or what anyone else faces. So the primary move towards equity is being able to see and not necessarily seeing as as seeing one person, but seeing all of us and all of our elements. Um, as usual, I have so much more to say on this topic, but I think I will end very quickly with a quote that means quite a bit to me um, from the writer Clarissa Brooks. She says, I don't want my body or my back to be the bridge used to build the world I'll never get to see. And to add to that, I don't want my body to be the doormat or the rug that everyone walks across to get to a point of equality. I want it to be the painting on the wall and my voice to be heard. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And there's an immediate question, which I wonder if we could come to, which I think would be really interesting just to hear your view on, which is um, from Subhadas. Would you like to ask your question, Suba? Sorry, I'm just trying to unmute myself. Yeah, hi, um, and thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, hugely inspirational already. Um, I mean, I suppose the challenge within all of this and within those of us who've worked within subsidised organisations in the UK over the past 10 years under austerity, you know, we talk about this desire to create change, to create elevation, to create equality what do we do when we acknowledge that we're doing that in the face of governments that actively oppose mobility, actively oppose justice? What can we do? Right, that's a great question. Um, and I think about this often because, um, as you might be able to tell from my accent, I live under uh, the tyrannical rule of a Cheeto. Um, and you know, I've gone through an evolution of, of thinking about this. It's constantly changing. Um, where I'm at right now is, to be totally candid, is to um, stand up and fight back. And I think the only way to really achieve true change um, is through what unfortunately is known as radical, um, radical revolution. Um, I think one day the idea of those of us who are considered radical, particularly within the creative, creative sphere, those of us who think that Black Lives Matter, um, which in the States is still considered by many to be a radical statement, um, I think until the radical becomes regular, we have to push back with every means that we have necessary. Um, you know, we live in countries that are predicated on the idea of oppressing others. And so this is not that our, our nations have evolved into this place over time. It's at their core. It's at their foundation. So when your core is rotten and also metastatic, how do you combat that? And, you know... My radical view is you do anything and everything that you can to push back against it, whether I'm not advocating for violence, but, you know. Um, and I, I guess I have a question in regards to that, Jasmine, which is just mm -hmm. for us in the UK here. Could you tell us a bit about how this role social justice curator came about in the Bronx Museum? Considering, sure. considering that sort of being within the institution. Sure. Operating um, from... From that foundation. So I should preface that with saying I swore to myself um, 
a long time ago that I would never work for an institution because I think that historically, an art institution, I should clarify, a visual art institution, because I think um, at their core and historically they're spaces of hegemonic, um, oppressive white supremacy. Um, that's frankly what they were founded on. They were founded to keep certain people in and certain people out and to make um, certain types of art canonical and valuable. Um, I don't believe in a singular canon anymore. Um, but I joined the Bronx Museum simply because that they, they decided to take this position of having a social justice stance and having a viewpoint that if a museum is really, as in the 21st century, many museums proclaim for the people and for the community, it has to actually reflect the constituency of the people it serves. And so in this time and place, when you're you know, trying to dismantle um, hegemonic structures, the only way to do that is to see that social justice is needed. Um, and so my role is to really, I think, subvert and counter the historic structure. Um, and I'm doing that really by amplifying the voices and artistic practices that not only reflect the communities that I'm working within, um, but also bring them into the conversation. So my approach as a curator is a democratic approach. Um, I survey the community and I survey um, my partners within the museum to create um, exhibitions that are not necessarily what I alone think that the com community should see, um, but what the community is asking to see. And so I guess the shorter answer is social justice does not always mean taking to the streets um, in certain ways, but it also means within the system how we change it and become more inclusive and multi-centric. Yeah, amazing. There's lots more questions for you. It's, we knew it would start, so it's beginning, the, the thought is going. I'm going to move on to Marcus and then we'll come back to a wider discussion if that's all right. But th thank you so much, so much richness there. So Marcus Fastini, I'm delighted, is with us from Rio. He is a Brazilian writer, theatre director, educator and filmmaker and cultural activist. Now, many of you might know he's the mastermind behind the educational methodology, and I'm going to say in English because my Portuguese is terrible, Network for Youth Agency, which has transformed the favelas of Rio and now has been adapted and adopted with partners across the UK namely the agency here in UK, which is a collaboration between Battersea Arts Centre and People's Palace Projects, whose director, Paul Heritage, I'm delighted to say, has kindly agreed to translate for us today. Now, first off, we're going to show you a pre-recorded video, which has English captions, uh, and then we'll come briefly to a point by Marcus before we open up for questions. So I'm just going to give um, the captioner a little bit of time and our brilliant Kath to put on the pre-recorded video. Well, and I should say that the um, that that this won't be BSL signed. A Agência de Redes para a Juventude é uma metodologia, um, um projeto, uma organização. Uh, nós existimos há 10 anos uh, e essa metodologia é fruto de outros projetos anteriores que já realizávamos. Uh, as pessoas que entreguem e integram o coração dessa metodologia, assim como eu, vem de famílias pobres de periferia, de favelas e são artistas que queriam criar algo que te fosse uma metodologia artística que transformasse territórios com foco em juventude. Então, há 10 anos, a gente atua em favelas, periferias, regiões da cidade com menor índice de desenvolvimento humano, 
aplicando essa metodologia que forma jovens líderes, jovens líderes de favela, escutando esse jovem, tratando como criador e ajudando ele a desenvolver ideias é, que podem transformar o seu território, mobilizar, fazer eles terem peso político na cidade. Essas ideias são ideias empreendedoras, ideias ativistas, ideias de ação comunitária. Desde 2010, nós já apoiamos mais de 100 projetos, frutos de ideias de jovens que participam dos nossos ciclos de formação. E daí surgiram ONGs que trabalham com meninas grávidas, é, surgiram projetos de cultura, uh, hip hop, cinema, arte, teatro, todos liderados por jovens e todos voltados para transformar o território. A nossa metodologia também ela é replicada em cidades fora do Rio de Janeiro, uh, ela é replicada em favelas do Espírito Santo, que é um estado dentro do Brasil, Uh, que já transferimos a metodologia para lá, também em Londres, em Manchester, Belfast, Cardiff é, e agora vamos começar a implementar ela online uh, na cidade do México, no México, em parceria com a Universidade de Stanford. É, então, o nosso trabalho ele é voltado em cima de três princípios, né? Nós chamamos esses três princípios de a prática da potência. A metodologia da agência ela trabalha com a prática da potência. O que é a prática da potência? Tratar o jovem de periferia como um criador, não como alguém que não sabe, não como alguém que precisa receber todos os conteúdos prontos ou como alguém perigoso, como a sociedade e os governos tratam hoje. É, esse é o primeiro passo. O segundo passo Segundo princípio é abrir redes na cidade, no mundo, para esse jovem. Seja um, fazer eles conhecerem grandes criadores, conhecerem as, as políticas públicas, os direitos, dar visibilidade para eles nos meios de comunicação. Então, todas essas redes de poder, redes de saber, redes de comunicação, nós buscamos abrir e fazer conexões para esses jovens. O terceiro ponto é a ação no território. Mesmo tempo que a gente abre a cidade para eles, a gente convoca eles para pensar no seu território, criarem ações no seu território, pensar através do conceito de território. Que teatro pode ser feito naquele território que é desigual? É, que ação empreendedora pode ser que reúna as habilidades do território? Então, a gente acredita que desse jeito a gente contribui para formar jovens líderes e formando jovens líderes, eles conseguem chegar em outros jovens, porque nós é, trabalhamos para que essas ações deles atinjam outros jovens. Nossa metodologia agora, durante a época da pandemia, formou 20 jovens que acharam mil famílias, 4 mil pessoas é, de famílias lideradas por jovens que ficaram ainda mais pobres, tiveram muitas mortes nas suas regiões. Nós estamos levando comida para essas pessoas, estamos levando livros, estamos produzindo informação e produzindo conhecimento. Acabamos de fazer uma pesquisa tentando demonstrar o impacto da pandemia nesses jovens e o que o governo deveria fazer, que é um outro trabalho da Agência de Redes para a Juventude, é criar voz política dentro das cidades, da sociedade, da imprensa, para poder que o assunto jovem pobre seja traba trabalhado como prioridade dentro dessas cidades das políticas públicas. Esse é o, o resumo da nossa história da Agência de Redes para a Juventude. Um prazer estar aqui com vocês. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so many principles there, Marcus, that are reflected in, in uh, so many burgeoning practices that were in the Gulbenkian's Rethinking Relationships study and, of course, in Contact, John's uh, organization way back. Um, Marcus, I wonder if we can come to you for a couple of live words before we go to some questions for you. And Paul is going to translate. Tá bom, Marcos, agora sem o grito de guerra. Uh, uh, 
Antes de tudo, obrigado pelo convite e agradecer o acolhimento. É muito bom estar aqui com vocês nesse momento. So, first of all, just to, first of all, first of all, just to thank you for inviting me, but also the way in which you embrace me and bring me in in such a warm way. It's so important at this moment. Desde 2011, a gente faz esse intercâmbio com o Reino Unido e eu aprendi muito com artistas, criadores, ativistas ingleses nessa troca nesses anos. Devo muita coisa que eu sinto e penso hoje a essa relação. Muito obrigado. I thank you so much because I owe so much of what I think and what I feel today to the exchange that I've had with artists, with creators, with activists in the United Kingdom in these nine years since we first started in 2011. O, o, o mundo da arte o mundo da arte, o mundo da cultura, é um mundo muito complicado para as pessoas pobres que vivem a vida lutando pela sobrevivência. Let's face it, but the world of art is incredibly complicated for poor young people to enter. They're just not going to get into that incredibly complex world that you're all part of. É, é um mundo cheio de códigos. It's a world full of codes. E é um mundo em guerra com ele mesmo. And you're, we're always at war with each other within this world. Para alguém pobre entrar neste mundo da arte, ele tem que estar muito forte, senão ele é destruído pelo mundo da arte. And any poor young person, anyone from a poor background who tries to get in there, is just going to be destroyed by those codes and that internal war we have. Em parte, parece que a arte quer os pobres como os personagens da sua arte, mas quando o pobre diz, eu também quero fazer com vocês, nós também temos medo. It seems that young, poor young people are often wanted as personalities, characters within our art, but when they try to say what they want to do, we don't want to listen to them. Primeira provocação, então, que eu queria fazer, eu vou fazer duas provocações para pensar, e isso não é o caminho da verdade, mas para pensar. So I'm going to é... make two provocations. I know this is not, uh, not laying out the way of truth for anyone, but I just want to make two provocations this morning. Como podemos nós, do campo da arte, do campo da ação social, da cultura, como podemos ter ideias mais simples para engajar as comunidades, os territórios conosco. Como podemos não, não como é como abolir essa essa coisa que já está na arte há muito tempo de que nós somos complexos. Como podemos criar coisas mais simples dentro do nosso território para trazer as pessoas? Uma ideia simples, por exemplo, que a gente tenta fazer na agência é Venha ter ideias conosco, jovem. Venha desenvolver as suas ideias. Aqui é algo muito simples. Como a arte pode ter ideias mais simples para se relacionar com as pessoas, para conviver com as pessoas? How can we be more simple? How can we just have simpler ideas that we can uh, that can emanate within the communities that we want to work with? How can we be there and just say simple things? How can we get away from this complexity of the arts, uh, which excludes people? So just one simple thing they're doing in the agency at the uh, Rio at the moment is just to be there in the communities and saying, come here and share your idea. Simple. Just a really simple thing to start. Por que que a gente acha que as nossas ideias devem ser assimiladas por toda a sociedade? Talvez o nosso papel seja, um, seja se tornar um ambiente para que as ideias floresçam democraticamente e não transmitir as ideias da arte para as pessoas. Our, our aim should not be to transmit ideas. That's when we, things get complex. Well, our, our aim, our, our ambition should be just to be the flux of ideas. How we can get ideas moving. A segunda provocação é sabemos que o mundo vai ficar mais desigual agora, mais brutal. Uh, não é suficiente para nós do campo da arte apenas tornar as nossas instituições ou o nosso meio democrático 
entre nós. Não é suficiente apenas a diversidade entre nós. É preciso que a gente traga, porque quem já está dentro da gente já superou alguma desigualdade. Quem está hoje no campo da arte já ultrapassou alguma desigualdade da sociedade, porque nós também temos filtro. Como trabalhar no território com os pobres? Por que nós não mergulhamos dentro do território com a nossa visão de artista para contribuir com o território e não para fazer o território ser arte? Fazer arte. Por que nós, artistas, não vamos por território? O território é onde a desigualdade vai aumentar. Se vai aumentar, não adianta ter diversidade só na arte. É preciso ir aos territórios pobres trabalhar com eles. It's not enough to make our institutions more diverse. All that will do is just change our institutions. They may be better. But what we should not be doing is thinking that that is going to change inequalities in society. His provocation is dive into those territories. Go to the territories and address the inequalities in those, uh, in those territories, not try to be thinking about the inequalities that may be within our cultural institutions. That time is over. We're not, we're not here to try and make ourselves better. We should be within these territories when, where there is extreme poverty. We should be trying to work in those territories to address those questions of, equal, of equality. Porque, encerrando, talvez seja mais importante estar em ação no território como artista do que representar esse território com excesso de códigos que a gente já carrega da arte. Talvez devemos levar a nossa habilidade de artista para que as comunidades, os territórios, se desenvolvam. E não que a gente seja o grande tradutor dessas, desses territórios. So, my final point. We're not there to represent, we're not there to translate these territories or these poor people. We should be there in those territories addressing those issues of inequality through our art. Brilliant. Brilliant. Obrigado. I'm so fired up by that, Marcus. Come on. Um, I think uh, I'd like to open up and I want to bring John back in. John, I can't see you, but I know that if you say something, you are there. Um, and I want to bring John back in because I want to pick up that point from Marcus and think about diving into those territories that Marcus has said. So how does that work thinking of a potential green recovery going forward? We've got a question here from Laura McDermott, specifically to John, but I think within that context of international exchange and local identities, it might be really interesting. Laura, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, yeah, thanks to all the speakers for their provocations. Um, but yeah, my question was originally to John. Thank you for your words and for the insight you shared from artists you're talking to all over the world. I wanted to ask how you can imagine international work shifting and changing in the coming years and decades in the context of a just green cultural recovery. Hey, Laura, thanks for that. Um, and lovely to see you. Um, I think the the answer is is rooted in the same thinking as uh, as the point that I was suggesting in relation to not using the same formats the gallery format the stage format the 730 show format to, to in a way make each work equivalent and the I think the same happens internationally you know the international sh um, tour the international festival um, the the ways of presenting work which are um, codified and therefore bring all work into a kind of equivalence where in fact what's most important is the the difference it, with the different ways in which each, each piece of work has been made and the different practices that it embeds. Um, so I think that for any international exchange we need to be asking the question of what is this work, how is it made, what is the context that it comes out of and what's a conversation between where that work has grown and where we are. And then what's the most appropriate um, nature of that exchange? Sometimes it might be as simple as you know, one person coming from one place to another to remake a, a piece of work. Other times the, 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 that conversation might be about, it might be about the digital, it might be about a concept that can travel the world and be re um, 
reimagined in each place that it goes to, but doesn't necessarily need to um, involve containers shipped around the world or multiple air journeys. So I think the, for me, the, the root of the question isn't to come up with another formula that says we must or mustn't do this, but to ask about the specificity of each encounter and how we engage with that specificity and make the, um, every expenditure on that encounter, whether that's a, an expenditure of time, money or carbon, um, be, be really worth it and really um, viable and valuable. Great, thanks John. And Eleanor's got a question for Yasmin about, Jasmine about the uh, relationship between the individual and the institution. Eleanor. If you unmute yourself, and they can hear you. Hiya, sorry. Um, thank you to all of you for what you said so far. Um, Jasmine, what you were talking about with um, not wanting to work in an institution unless you could be sure that they were committed through the, the social justice curator it made me think, um, how have you, but also others, uh, navigated that relationship between an individual and an institution working for equity? Um, it has been, well, okay, admittedly, I've only been um, in this institutional space, the specific institutional space since February. Um, so it has definitely been an adjustment since New York shut down in March. <laughs> but um, I think one of the things that has made it easier and more, I easier than I thought it would be, is that there is sort of this holistic sense amongst the staff, um, as well as the board, that this was really necessary. Um, and the museum institution that I work for has been uh, an outlier because of the community that it serves and because of its mission to continue to serve that community. Um, so I think my role there is kind of a culmination of a demand, an internal demand. Um, I think the challenge that other institutions may face if they were to implement a similar type of position is that my experience with other museums is that they're fairly reticent about change. Um, you know, there's a lot of lip service about wanting to diversify, but as the other speakers have um, also noted, diversity is not the same as inclusion. And it's really important for this need for change to come from within the institution first, um, which means I think a lot of institutions need to do proper ABAR, which is um, anti-bias, anti-racist training before they sort of jump head into wanting to do something that's public facing. Um, you know, in order to, in order to put something forth, you have to make sure your own house is clean first. Um, and I think one of the challenges for other people, and I've been extremely privileged to be amongst a staff that, again, really advocated for my role to be there rather than someone saying from the outside that my role had to be there. Um, the challenge will be um, for that need to come from within um, and sort of to try and dismantle, and when I say dismantle, I don't mean just fire everyone who's already there and bring in an entire new staff, but to add to the existing structures and the existing people that are within those frameworks, um, add room for change and evolution. One of the biggest issues that I've seen in institutions that they've become stagnant um, and sort of calcified in this need to do the bare minimum for diversity um, and inclusion. That means they're looking for optics and not actual systemic change. Mm. I don't know if that answered your question or if I'm just rambling on. <laughs> I think there's a really interesting connection there with both Marcus and John. I wonder, John, given that you are building this new institution, um, what to, how does Jasmine's um, thoughts there resonate with you in terms of all of the questions you might be going through in building the factory? 
Yeah, well, it's a it's a very um, a unique moment to be um, taking an organisation like Manchester International Festival on the journey towards being a, a space. Um, and I think you could probably tell from um, my presentation that I'm provoking myself really and the organisation to think about what does that mean in terms of how do we not present things in ways that the the often where where the content even the artists who are invited can be radical and pushing for, um, for for change and for a different vision of society, but the frame in which they are presented neutralizes that. And I, I think that that's where I hear a real connection with what Jasmine's saying and also what Marcus was saying about getting outside of the, the spaces of the institutions and having real conversations with real people, that we have to um, be perpetually deconstructing the, the um, structures that we're part of because those structures will de facto end up um, closing in to, to limit the work and to limit the, the energy of the work. And that's not, not so much a, 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 a failure that we can stop, but, a, but, but a, um, a challenge that we can continually address. So for me, trying to now put together a, a new version of an institution, for those who don't know, we're building a a space called the factory that will be a, a year-round space out of the, the practice of the festival. Um, how do we create that concept of a space that is about invitation and is about openness and is about the, the principles of, of democracy that Jasmine was talking about and is per perpetually rigorous in addressing the inevitable ways in which structures will start to limit. Mm. I think in that in that frame of, of asking those questions, I wonder if we could come to Ellen Booth um, from Coventry, who um, wants to ask Marcus about how you ask those questions and how you have those conversations and how does it affect the co-creation of work? Ellen. Hi Claire, yeah, I think you just explained it in a nutshell. I think it's what are the those simple ways of framing questions to start that journey with communities um, that isn't about imposing but is about supporting them to open up to new possibilities. Yeah, Marcos, então é uma pergunta para você direto sobre a questão de como abrir essas perguntas de uma forma mais simples e mais direto para as comunidades. Uh, no ano de eu não estou dizendo que este é o caminho único, né? mas no ano uh, de 2017, uh, nós fizemos uma ação chamada Todo Jovem é Rio, que nós realizamos é, encontros dentro da casa de jovens de favelas mais violentas e mais desiguais é, para conversar com esses jovens sobre política, arte, cultura e ter apresentações, abrir a casa para levar outros certo. jovens, levar artistas e conversar sobre essa experiência. Uma ideia de conexão, o artista estando ali para ajudar a questão da juventude que estava buscando melhorar o seu desempenho na escola, na, na vida. Então, tá. ir até a casa das pessoas e não virar apenas um lugar especial para aprender a ser gente, as instituições. Well, well let's first, this is not the only way, of course, just one of the actions they took in 2017, uh, which was called Every Young Person is Rio. Rio obviously means the city and also a river. Um, and they, in, they stopped trying to get young people to come into their, our buildings, like our theatres or our galleries, and try and be like us. The idea must be to try and get into those houses, and that's what they did. They, are, they set up a program where young people invited about 20 other people uh, into their house to have a debate about art and culture and politics and schooling and everything. So the young person would invite people from their own street, but also an agency would work with them to get a, a variety of people. They could be the mayor or they could be... John McGrath from Manchester International Festival, whoever they would be, they, who they wanted to have in their house, agency would make sure that they were there in their house, having those debates, talking, and that young people themselves were hosting those debates. And they did thousands across Rio. 
ah, tudo que foi dito aqui por todos nós e escrito são caminhos valiosos. Nenhum caminho é melhor que o outro. Mas eu acho que existe uma questão crucial. Nós não podemos reformar as nossas organizações internamente para depois ir até a comunidade. Isso é um pensamento de elite. O capitalismo hoje quer consertar por dentro, fazendo um capitalismo pseudoambiental. Nós não podemos ser assim. Nós temos que incluir a comunidade, estar dentro dela e não ser uma ilha dentro da comunidade. Me parece que o princípio central é esse do território, como abrir nossas comunidades para as pessoas não discutirem arte com a gente, não verem arte, mas para discutir coisas que são relevantes para a vida delas e a gente como artista se colocar ali como uma pessoa que contribui para aquilo com a nossa experiência. Então, me parece que fazer a instituição aberta é ir também até a casa das pessoas e não só abrir as portas, é servir aos desejos e os desafios daquele território. Né? O território será a grande disputa da desigualdade do capitalismo. Nós não podemos disputar okay. só a desigualdade. <laughs> so, those of you that have listened to uh, Marcus before will have learned one Portuguese word, that is territorio. So, territory is that word that he, he, he keeps reinforcing. We, he loves the discussion, he's reading, reading all the comments from everyone, he loves hearing you talking about reforming institutions, he knows that's important, but it doesn't mean anything if we're not out there in those territories and opening those doors, us, people inviting us into their houses, into their territories. He thinks the reform of institutions is, is usually an elite capitalist uh, necessity, where institutions will keep reforming themselves so they can be better parts of the market. But what he's talking about is a completely different approach, which, yes, you're going to have reforms of the institutions, but it needs to come the other way around. With those institutions, you've got to dismantle in a way that they're in those territories, that they're able to have people from those territories as part of their institutions, and to think about it not as a process that can, starts with us, but starts with them. Só para finalizar, Paul, é, a arte na história da humanidade tem a capacidade de transmitir conhecimentos através de gerações. Nós recebemos conhecimento de períodos artísticos anteriores, em suas contradições. Nós não podemos querer ser os únicos donos desse conhecimento, nós temos que colocar ele a serviço das comunidades pobres e não apenas fazer obras de arte sobre elas. O que nós, o modo de pensar do artista tem que estar a serviço das ações dentro dos territórios contra a desigualdade. Isso é urgente. Nós não podemos mais ficar desconectado das pessoas pobres nos territórios. So this is our urgent call just to finish to say how can we put art at the service of the desires and the needs these incredibly urgent needs, particularly at the moment of these communities. Art transmits ideas across generations. That's what we do. We've done that for so what, what long. But now we need to think about how those uh, people in those communities can work, how they can be the center of that focus, of that transmission. It's not about us transmitting ideas from past generations. It's about how we can be at the, how we can use our art to be at the service of these communities at the moment of this urgent need. Thank you. I specifically want to bring in a couple of other people here uh, before we wrap up the Q&A. And I think what connects all of these comments, so I'm thinking Claire Lim, Grace, and might come to you, Zara, in a sec, uh, Ash Harper, um, which is really about how does that then transform what we do and the institutions we may or may not intersect with, whether we're based in an institution, whether we're freelance artists that work with institutions. I think Zara's um, question is really beautifully put. So Zara, can I ask you to ask it to either John or Jasmine, actually? Hi guys, thanks so much uh, for today. It's been really interesting and fun, just fantastic. Um, my question is something that I've been um, reflecting on a lot recently, and it's really about um, the role of love in rebuilding um, or, or provoking institutions into a new way of thinking and feeling. John, particularly, you mentioned uh, souls and vulnerability, which kind of really triggered that connection for me. Um, and I was hoping that you might just expand a bit on that and or sort of just share a bit about what you thought in regards to um, sort of disruptive power 
of love in, um, it, in its uh, sort of unusualness in being centralized in the conversation around in institutions? Well, what, a, what a great question. And I, I think the, the, the boldness to introduce words like love into the equation when we're dealing with something that, that can sound as grim as institutions and structures <laughs> is so important. And I think you know, what, what I hear from both Marcus and Jasmine is that, you know, the, that this is, we have, we have to deprofessionalize what we do. This is all about wanting, you know, it, it is about deep, profound and life-changing connections between um, everybody involved in this work, whether that's um, uh, individuals from a community, whether that's someone within an arts organization, whether it's the artist presenting work. And, and I think that, you know, vulnerability is, is, is a condition of love in many ways, isn't it? And that, that sense that by my encounter with you, I will be changed is, is really important. And so I think that, uh, you know, I, like Marcus, I've worked a lot of time outside of buildings and, you know, in various spaces and places with different communities, with differing artists. And that, that sense of, of being um, ready to be in another place, ready to be in somebody else's home, somebody else's heart is really important. Um, likewise, that, that capacity to say, I am being changed by you, can I invite you into my space, even though I don't know what, what will happen, is an important part of, uh, is an equally important part of the equation. So I think, you know, to bring it to something as, as simple, complex and bold as love is a, is a, um, is a wonderful intervention to make. Well, sorry, I'm muted. Um, Jasmine, did you have anything to add to that? I actually don't. I think John put it really beautifully. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm just gonna steal from you. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, you know, going forward, it's going to be really interesting to see how our ideas are transformed by the conversations, John, that you referred to right at the beginning of your provocation. So I was thinking about how that stepping out of your comfort zone, picking up the phone, having a socially distanced meeting with someone in the park, going and visiting people and opening up your perspectives. It was such a beautiful way to begin this assembly, thank you. Um, because this is what this is about, not staying in our bubble, but being, opening ourselves up to those ideas and seeing the creative work that might um, develop. I think um, I, there's time for one more question. We're gonna to go to Claire Lim um, to ask about this idea of audience and how it might be changed through this cultural reset program, Claire. Hello. Um, it was really just an observation that working in an institution, I work in a dance house um, uh, that has a theatre, that has a, a kind of strong focus around bringing in audiences, working with audience development. And is, is audience a useful term? And is it a, a term that we could perhaps move away from and think about that agency, that exchange, that change, change making? Um, that call to radical action that Jasmine talked about because I do find that sometimes I, I really switch off when we talk about audiences um, because it sounds so passive. Yeah, I really hear that. Any of the speakers want to come back to that? No. Marcus, você entendeu a pergunta sobre a passividade de públicos, de plateia, você quer comentar? Como a gente pode uh, desenvolver formatos que são onde a, o público, a plateia é menos passiva? Uh, só na relação, eu acho que não deve, a nossa relação com a plateia não deve ser na hora de só sobre o assunto fazer uma peça, ver uma peça ou fazer uma peça. Eu acho que o assunto com Com, com a nossa plateia, deve tratá-lo como público e não como espectador. É, o espectador é um momento interessante da vida de público, mas eu acho que as instituições devem estar abertas a ser, estar em outras funções, até para abrigar o conflito. Alguém me perguntou sobre como, como lidar com as questões de misoginia dentro dos territórios, tem que abrir espaços para se debater e conversar sobre isso. 
Se você é alguém presente num território, você, quando for levantar e dizer que algo está sendo racista, algo está sendo que está tendo misoginia, você vai, você vai ser respeitado para ouvir em sua voz. Se você só é um artista que aparece de vez em quando, você vai poder estar correto na sua visão, mas você não vai ter a menor importância porque você é de outro mundo, não é do mundo daquelas pessoas. Então, eu acho que tem que tratar a plateia como público. Público é interação sobre tudo. Né? Espectador é só sobre a obra. Nosso único assunto com a nossa plateia não pode ser só a obra. It's it's about he loved the question. It's about the movement from being spectators to being a public. In Portuguese, the word, most common word for audience is public, uh, and that's a really useful word to remember. How can we create that public realm, that public domain? And somebody else had asked him about misogyny, which is when it appears in territories or racism, how can we address those things? And that's because when we are part of them as a public, not just inviting them into our buildings, which is important. But, but when we're actually with them as a public, we have the right to stand up and say, that's misogynist or that's racist. But that comes from a right that comes from being present. And it's about our presence with them in their territories, which will change the relationship that they will have in, in the buildings that we, we are operating. So it, it cannot happen just at that moment of spectatorship. It has to be about constantly con uh, constructing the realm of the public. I, I really love that. So helpful to see it from that point of view and that perspective. So I'm just going to ask our speakers for one more thing, and it's a very quick fire. We've got a couple of minutes. <laughs> Single sentence, please, Marcus. Um, uh, which is, uh, given what we've, everyone in the world has been through in the last four months, and everybody here personally, what would you do, speakers? Uh, what single th thing might you do differently when you come out the other side of this as a result of going through COVID in your professional life? Who wants to go first? Wow. Uh... <laughs> I'm yeah, gonna... that's a... I, uh, I... Marcus, Sorry. go. No, Marcus, no, so... go. You go. You, you first. Don't know. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> okay. um, that's a really uh, difficult question that I've... Trying to, to think about... Um, working in two geographic spaces that have been um, exceptionally hard hit uh, as far as the mortality rate, um, which are Newark, New Jersey, and the Bronx, um, which also happen to be locations that are predominantly um, within, predominantly black and brown, and also um, in the lower economic spectrum and also where most of the essential workers um, live, where a lot of people are talking about um, everyone is appreciative of the essential work, but not the essential workers, um, which is a glaring, a, a glaring sort of reality that's coming to light now. And I think one of the things that I would do in returning um, is think about the intersections that we often don't think about when we're thinking about our audiences or collaborators, um, however we ultimately decide to refer to them or our public. Um, I should note that I don't believe in a single public, but again, publics, plural. Um, and I think thinking about the intersections of poverty, um, economics, race, and gender as I go back and approach how I construct programs and um, exhibitions as well as community outreach because at least here those are often we often talk about race and gender without talking about some of the other identities and intersections and I think excluding those um, 
has put us as, as societies in some ways in the position that we're in now. So thinking about um, education or educational access, um, financial inequity, ability, and all of these ideas when returning to back to work um, and in real life and being very cognizant of those particular aspects. Um, yeah. Not only being cognizant, but actively addressing them. Um, mm -hmm. Thank, thanks, Jasmine. And John and Marcus, just one sentence, if you can. Uh, no mundo ainda mais desigual, é, onde a desigualdade é o maior, a maior experiência econômica e estética do mundo, não faz menor sentido a, a, a gente, os artistas, não estarem lutando contra essa desigualdade. Equality is the greatest aesthetic and political problem that we face. So we have to be there in those places of the most inequality. Thank okay. you. And John, finally. Um, I, I was going to, um, when someone, someone mentioned audiences before and, and should we leave the word audiences, I, I was thinking, well, I, I would hold on to it if it means we're listening together. And I think what I would take out of this moment, and, and who knows how we'll respond coming out of this, but I think I would take the, the commitment to listening um, and to listening as variously as possible and then to enacting the results of that listening, both within me and within the spaces and places that I work. Thank you so much. Um, wow, what an afternoon. Thank you so much. My hands is exploding. Um, just to let everybody know, um, the videos of these provocations will be on the website and dropped into Slack tomorrow morning. So you can listen at your leisure with captions. Um, and also lots of links and resources from our speakers will be in, dropped into Slack so you can explore their work and articles on the work that they've done in more detail. So handing over to David. Thank you. Just to reiterate what Claire has just said, what an extraordinary and rich afternoon of provocations. So thank you to John, to Jasmine and Marcus, and to all of you for your contributions to that conversation. Um, a few little bits of final housekeeping before we finish, as promised, at 3.30. Um, a reminder, as Richard said earlier, the programme is divided into two cohorts. Cohort one starts this week. Cohort two begins in uh, the week of the 17th of August. Um, cohort one, you will receive your Zoom links for the program and your group today. So uh, look out for those in Slack. Slack is the place where everything is happening. So all of your instructions will come through Slack. So do make sure you're checked in to your Slack group and that you're regularly checking in for uh, details of new contents, new instructions that you might want to follow there. The website is live, so do um, join the website. It's not just uh, for the 192 of you, the participants, but also for everyone. There's uh, a growing repository there of content, articles, videos, podcasts, and we would like you also to feel like you can contribute to that growing repository too. So if there are things that you think are useful to share, uh, not just with the program, but more widely, then do let us know through the Slack channel and we will try and distribute that um, content more widely. Um, we recognise that we're all working on dozens of things at the same time whilst we're on this programme, we're all busy people, and so we'd like to encourage you to take some of the conversations that the programme brings up onto social media. Uh, we're using the hashtag Culture Reset, and that's not to advertise the programme, but it's a way of framing a wider conversation and debate about what the future of our arts sector might look like. So use hashtag culture reset to continue the conversation uh, more widely across our sectors. Uh, a few final bits of housekeeping as we approach the 3.30 uh, hour or half hour. Uh, Claire, Richard, Zara and I will be dropping into your groups uh, to hear how things are going over the next eight weeks. So um, we don't want to uh, impose on you, but we're very keen to hear more about the quality of the conversations that you're having. And I just wanted to conclude by saying thank you to our facilitators who are an extraordinary group of people who we're really looking forward to uh, working uh, with you in your groups. Um, I know Claire and I wanted to thank Richard and Zara and an amazing team of people who pulled this together 
so quickly uh, and at relatively short notice. Uh, thank you again to Gulbenkian, uh, our funders for the programme, uh, but mostly uh, thanks to you, thanks to the 192 of you. Really looking forward to the next few weeks. Have a great afternoon. See you soon. Bye. Thank you.